to, to meet our spring-like uh, or fall-like. Beautiful. Know, kind of today, but unique. Um, so he has his PhD from, in political science from UC Berkeley and a master of develop, master's of development studies from Georgetown. But uh, most important to know maybe is uh, that he has a BA in development studies from Brown. That's right. That's absolutely the most important distinction. That's familiar territory. Um, and he's the author of this book here, which I'll ask him to, to hold up and then I'll pass it around. Oh, yes, that's please. Okay. Oh, that'd be lovely. Black Markets and Militants, Informal Networks in the Middle East, in the Middle East and Africa, just published by Cambridge University Press. And um, we asked him to come talk because of the, the, the events in Sudan in the last several months, um, but also the last several years as well. Um, that's right. And so the title of, of uh, Professor Madani's talk today is Our Revolution is Peaceful, Understanding the Domestic and Regional Factors Behind Sudan's Political Crisis and the Prospects for a Transition to Civilian Democracy. And he's just been to Sudan a month ago. That's right, yeah. So thank you so much for coming. Let's welcome you. I don't know if I need a mic. Probably not, right? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. This is so exciting for me. I was here two years ago. So every time I come back to my alma mater, it's so exciting. I can tell you all my memories here and being part of student organizations. I hope they're still going on, whether it was African Students or the Middle East Students Association. So I was very heavily involved and even with the undergraduate finance board, if that's still around, I'm not sure. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I was on that committee. So it's a real pleasure. And thank you for your interest in Sudan, which of course is also my country. And um, I wanted to speak about... Um, the title here, Our Revolution is Peaceful. And the reason I chose that title is that when I first began to do research on the revolution in Sudan in 2000, late 2018, I arrived in Sudan, and uh, probably the first person to describe to me what the revolution was about told me in Arabic, Thawrat uh, Nesilmiya, Our Revolution is Peaceful. And I thought, you know, what, is, what does that mean, you know? Um, and in the marches and the protests and all the civil disobedience that toppled the former dictator in 2019, this uh, slogan was the most important. And I want to explain why it is so important and why it has captured the imagination of the entire world. Uh, and I would even venture to say reinvigorated discussions about global democracy in the context of uh, a cynicism associated with the literature on the dying of democracy. And of course, next week, uh, President Biden is going to be speaking about how to stop democratic reversals, as he puts it. Sudan, then, is really important for Africa, for the Middle East, but also uh, globally, uh, in terms of what it means about rejuvenating uh, democracy from the grassroots. And so I wanted to talk about the domestic and regional factors associated with the democratization of the country and the obstacles uh, moving forward uh, to uh, a possible uh, civilian democracy. And I want to do that, you know, just lightly. I am a political scientist, so unfortunately, I'm going to do a little political science conceptual work. Uh, and that would include um, talking about certain elements associated with what we know about democratic uh, consolidation, um, having to do with um, the role of political parties, um, the role of international support, um, the role of the coercive apparatus of the state. Uh, these are factors that uh, we have to take very seriously when we try to evaluate whether um, democracy is going to come to Sudan, civilian democracy. Before I do that, I wanted, of course, to, since I'm in my alma mater, definitely plug my book, which just came out in, in October. Uh, this book is related to this talk, but it's a little bit broader, and it addresses the issue of economic globalization, the expansion of informal markets and the informal economy, um, and how that has led to different types of identity politics in Egypt, in Sudan, and Somalia. The focus on it is labor remittances, and that is how I define economic globalization. For those of you unfamiliar, labor remittances constitute the most important source of foreign exchange uh, for the, the majority of labor exporting countries in the Middle East and Africa. And this uh, project began with a puzzle, you know, if this was such an important form of um, financial inflows, why uh, can't we uh, really study its political effects, its political outcomes? 
Uh, and so very briefly, the, not briefly, but the book really looks at these three comparative cases, Egypt, Sudan, and Somalia, arguing that what makes a difference in terms of um, uh, if we have Islamist movements or militant organizations or even ethnic organizations, as in the case of Somalia, depends on the capacity of the state to regulate these very, very important financial inflows. Uh, what is relevant to this talk is that the chapters on Sudan address the issue of informal markets or, and black, uh, black markets in the rise of the Islamist movement in Sudan. The remnants of this Islamist movement, as I'll show in a minute, are crucial in our understanding of whether democratization will occur in Sudan or whether there will be an obstacle against it. Um, I'm going to describe to you very briefly um, the relationship between illicit financial flows and the patronage networks that have built up the Islamist um, movement in Sudan and how that is um, witnessing a resurgence in the context of present politics in, in Sudan. So if you're interested in Egypt, Somalia, and particularly Sudan, hopefully you'll find the book informative. Um, what has happened in Sudan very recently is a very important military coup or consequential military coup that happened on October 25th. This gentleman here, General Abdel Fattah Burhan, uh, basically dissolved what was then a partnership uh, government between the civilian leadership in Sudan and the military leadership. He dissolved that uh, transitional government. He fired all of the uh, council of ministers or the ministers in the, in the council, uh, uh, dissolved that council. He declared a state of emergency. Um, he imprisoned over 100 political prisoners. Um, and a number of human rights violations quickly occurred. It was a classic form of a military coup in Africa. He, of course, denied uh, remarkably, incredibly, that it was in fact a military coup. I'm going to discuss uh, what motivated this gentleman to upend uh, this very hard-fought um, experiment in democratization. Um, but what happened uh, on November 21st, very recently, is this is the former civilian prime minister who he imprisoned, and then on November 21st, he reinstated this uh, prime minister without any um, uh, inclusion of the majority of the political parties in the country. So whereas... When he took over the coup, the entire world condemned it, the United Nations, the European Union, the World Bank, IMF, the African Union, uh, strong condemnation, particularly on the part of the United States. Uh, since the reinstatement of this gentleman, what we have really seen is um, uh, less uh, robust condemnation. Um, the United States and other countries, I would argue, are looking to see whether this particular configuration is going to lead to stability, uh, and that, of course, is in the interest of the United States in the region, in the Horn, but also uh, the Arab countries, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. So this is where we stand at the moment. What I want to do is, because here I'm here at Brown, I'm going to highlight the overarching question um, that was um, noted by the Brown Daily Herald two years ago when I was here. In an interview, uh, the journalist from the Brown uh, Daily Herald um, I was going to mention his name, but you know, have to ask his permission first. But this is the quote that, uh, that he had, um, and you'll see it in the archive. Um, Madani, that's me, questioned whether the agreement was an actual step toward creation of a true democracy. The real issue at stake is, are we transitioning from an authoritarian regime to a civilian democracy, or is this just another example of a hybrid authoritarian regime? This is, continues to be the question. This is what I said two years ago. And as much as I was positive and optimistic, I realized that this would be the enduring question of the Sudanese political crisis. It remains so, and now it's even, much, even more important. Um, but I want to, before discussing the obstacles and prospects for civilian democracies, to highlight what's at stake. Why should we care? Why should we care about democracy in Sudan? Um, well, um, we can care because democracy is important, but I want to be a little bit more strategic, maybe, um, and talk about the geostrategic aspects of uh, democratization in Sudan. This is Sudan, and for those of you unfamiliar, it has been experiencing the longest series of civil wars in the continent of Africa. Uh, these are the three conflict zones that four you may have heard of. Um, South Kordofan, Blue Nile. All of these elements or regions in blue have been undergoing civil conflict at least since 2003. Um, in Darfur alone, 200,000 have been killed, um, 1.2 displaced in Sudan and across the borders. 
this is what's at stake. What is at stake is the humanitarian toll that is really has undermined um, uh, the livelihoods of millions and millions of people in the Nuba Mountains in South, South Kurdufan, half a million have been killed, or the majority of them civilians, because of the escalation of war by the central state. If you look geographically, the Red Sea region is also one of the most strategic in the entire world. And right now, Sudan is in the midst of a deep competition between the United States, the United Arab Emirates, Russia, um, China, um, Egypt. Uh, this region is so important, and it has determined the regional actor's relationship to what is going on in Sudan. So, for reasons of human rights and humanitarianism, uh, democracy and this question becomes important. And for the geostrategic stability of the Horn of Africa, you all know what is ongoing in Ethiopia right now. One of the largest and most powerful countries in the world is um, you know, imploding in ways that are going to determine not only the Horn of Africa's future, but the future of the Red Sea region. I want to quickly do an outline because um, Daniel said, don't take more than 40 minutes, right? 45 minutes. 45 minutes, yeah. So I'm going to, you can just motion to me when <laughs> I go over, which I probably do. This is why I want you to do an outline so I can go quickly, and if you guys have any questions, you can, you can pose them. Um, I want to talk very briefly about the revolution itself, because without understanding the roots of the revolution of 2018 and 2019, it's impossible to evaluate the prospects for democratization and then talk about the rise and fall of this uh, previous regime that uh, the activists really appended. And here is where the book becomes relevant. In, I'm going to discuss very quickly the rise of the deep state, um, the military deep state in Sudan that is becoming extremely difficult to unravel by pro-democracy activists. And I would argue, if you read those two chapters in Sudan, it details specifically how the Islamists were actually able to construct this deep state, not only institutionally, but also ideologically. Um, and I want to address the reasons for the persistence of authoritarian in the country, the fall of the Bashir, and most importantly, really discuss the success of the movement and conclude with the coup itself and discuss the obstacles and prospects for democratization. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, and I'm going to emphasize domestic and, uh, factors and uh, you know, uh, region, regional factors as well. Um, very quickly, this is where I, since we're a small group, I'm going to say that uh, this is a, a great source of pride for us who Sudanese to see a movement of millions, civil disobedience uh, of a type that uh, the African continent or the Arab world has not really witnessed. And this is why it's really important. I want to describe what uh, and how the, this young people in general, I've been doing research on them aside from this book since 2011 on the youth activist in the country. This is um, the sit-in that was really um, very important. On April 6, 2019, borrowing the example of the sit-in in Tahrir in Egypt, uh, Sudanese in their millions sat in front of the, uh, their army headquarters for two reasons. One of them was to generate a critical mass. It was actually the idea of an engineering student in the University of Khartoum who came up with the idea that it was important to develop a critical mass and he borrowed the ideas from um, Mahatma Gandhi actually and the kind of modes of civil disobedience. Um, and what's really interesting is that the location was not only constructed to amass a huge number of people from the entire country, but to be in front of the army headquarters to elicit support from mid-ranking officers, uh, encourage them to defect against the, the dictator, and join them in the revolution with the full knowledge with that without the military, there was no way that they could win this revolution. On April 11th, they got what they wanted. Uh, Omar Bashir, who had ruled Sudan for 30 years, was ousted by General Burhan, who is now leading uh, the military government. Um, and following that, Burhan said exactly what he's saying now. I'm gonna take over and I will oversee uh, elections in two years. He's saying that exactly right now. He's even saying, and he said in April 11, 2019, that he's going to absolutely uh, leave government uh, and retire once the elections occurred. For Sudanese and others who are 
who know Sudan well. This is uh, really the plan that Burhan has now. It's also what the military leaders, uh, his allies, had planned all along. They had no intention of uh, fulfilling the promise of a full civilian democracy. The difference here was that in late May, exactly what is happening now, um, millions of Sudanese uh, performed or executed forms of civil disobedience that um, really uh, had never really been uh, occurred in Sudan before or in the region. And that is they brought the whole country to a halt. Uh, public sector workers, unions, professional associations, not only in the capital city, but throughout the country, even in the port of the Red Sea, where workers went on strike. This was so, um, uh, you know, disturbing to the military that they um, went to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Egypt and uh, tacitly got their support to execute one of the most violent crimes that occurred in Sudan, and that is on June 3rd, they moved into the sit-in and killed and raped uh, women, killed uh, young people, threw bodies into the Nile waters. Some of the bodies had not expired yet. I mean, the amount of violence becomes important as a catalyst for future persistence. When I'm always asked, will these young people continue to protest? And they will, because I've talked to them, <laughs> and this is one of the reasons they'll continue to protest. June 4th, um, the military thought that it had um, won, so it scrapped the agreement that, uh, what, that it had with the civilian government, um, and that becomes a really important turning point in terms of the rise of the, this government. What happened is the African Union steps in, suspends the, 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 the Sudanese government and the, uh, from its membership, um, and this gentleman here, uh, the U.S. mediates, this gentleman here intervenes to uh, broker uh, an agreement between the civilians and the military. Notice this is a period where he was just about to receive the Nobel Prize for peace. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, right, and uh, and a period where you know um, uh, Ethiopia represented a hegemonic country, you know, uh, great influence. Uh, this is where the changes in regional dynamics affect domestic politics in the region. What's happening in Ethiopia right now is completely the opposite. Uh, the instability in Ethiopia makes it very difficult to mediate uh, and resume a democratic uh, turn. I'm going to go quickly because I want to get to the points that I think will be of greater interest, um, but I just wanted to quickly discuss what um, the Brown Daily Herald report had noted, and that is that this was from the beginning what we call in political science a hybrid authoritarian regime, and that is it was a mix of civilians and leaders. This is the structure of it. Uh, it was established uh, through the negotiation by Ethiopia uh, between civilian and military leaders to have a sovereign council that had five military people, five uh, civilians, and the prime minister minister would be um, agreed upon by the two sides. That prime minister became, of course, uh, Abdullah Hamdok, who I just mentioned at the beginning. Uh, the second aspect of this uh, system was the rotational presidency. Um, and that is that after a certain uh, number of months, the military leader, Burhan, would give up power to a civilian leader. In this case, it would be Hamdok. Why is this important? Because when Biden's special envoy to the Horn of Africa went on the 24th of October to Sudan, Feltman went to Burhan and Hamdok and said, well, it's time is up. You're supposed to give up uh, power to a civilian leader. He goes to Qatar, flies off, and the next day Burhan wages this uh, uh, coup, uh, <clears throat> precisely to stop and interrupt this kind of agreement. This is one of the reasons Biden's statements were so strong. Uh, first, because presumably they're interested in democratization, but another is because his envoy was insulted. Um, and that is initially why, uh, it's also why it was so strong. The final aspect is really important and really uh, explains the greatest obstacle to democratization, and that is the establishment of a parliament, a legislative body. That did not occur um, because the military uh, leader, Burhan, refused to implement it. Without a representative parliament, there was no way that you could have any kind of democracy or consolidation of democracy. One of the things that Burhan did, the general, was to prevent this from, being, from happening. Very quickly, I want to explain why this book is relevant. Keep going back to the book. <laughs> and that is to understand the rise of the Islamist movement. Sudan is unique in the Arab-speaking world in the sense that it's the only country, Arab-Sunni Muslim country, where the Islamist movement has taken over power. 
I'm often asked what lessons does Sudan have for others, and uh, some of them are good, and some of them are consequential in the sense that this is the only country where the Islamist movement was able to dominate um, the political landscape at the level of the state. And the way that it was done was through a, um, a policy called the policy of empowerment that Professor Frizzetti knows full well. And uh, this was in Arabic uh, called Tamkeen. And they, it had four uh, pillars. Uh, one of them was uh, similar to other African countries and other countries worldwide where the state uses um, uh, rents, uh, whether it is uh, oil or any other kind of revenue, and redirects them to uh, its loyalists in order to build up a constituency to support the state. The other was to purge the bureaucracy from non-loyalists. This saw the period of the imprisonment and expulsion of uh, civil servants, bureaucrats, uh, anyone that did not affiliate to the Islamist movement. The other aspect is what this book is about, uh, partly, and that is the monopolization of labor remittances in the black market and the foreign exchange markets um, in ways that would be funneled into Islamist banks, and those banks then would be a primary mode of recruitment for new loyalists to the Islamist movement. This becomes really important because the civilian government, before it was overthrown, uh, liberalized the financial markets, bringing the foreign currency and local currency together on par, thereby undercutting the financial networks of Burhan and the Islamist. Now what we're seeing, of course, as soon as they resume power, is that they are manipulating once, uh, once again the black markets in order to finance their Islamist movement. The United States is not really aware of this yet. Egyptians are concerned but are not really convinced. But I can guarantee you they will be very concerned very, very soon. The uh, fourth pillar is extremely important and that is the coercive apparatus. Um, what, you know, and this is of course similar to other African countries, but in the case of Sudan, it was very important for the Islamist movement to undermine the national army. Uh, what Sudanese call al-Jaysh al-Sharif, the honorable uh, parts of the army. And the best way to do that was to um, establish a wide variety of militias. Um, that would be in competition with the national officers with the sta standard army. The most notable, of course, was the rapid support forces. Uh, this is the force that went to Darfur, um, paid by the government, uh, to kill those 200,000 Darfurians. So that's the, our, uh, the rapid support forces. I'll refer to them in a second. Understanding the obstacles to democratization in Sudan is similar to other authoritarian countries. These are the elements I began the discussion with. The level of civil society, how strong is it in Sudan, um, how divided the civil opposition is, and the level of international support. You will hear the discourse on the part of Burhan and the military establishment, and let's say even the Egyptian government, that Sudan does not have a a united civil society. And uh, one of the pretexts of this kind of uh, coup was the General Burhan said that, well, um, you know, I had to do this because these people keep fighting each other, as if political parties are not supposed to compete. But the discourse that now is uh, persuasive to Arab countries in particular, and European countries as well, is that this is a country where the civil society is very divided, and it's better to have the stability of military regime over a competition of political parties in civil society. Um, the issue of international support is extremely important, um, and I would argue in this historical moment it has become the most important. Um, and finally, of course, is that the strength of the coercive apparatus, the level of repression that this government is uh, embarked in. So explaining the success of the, because I know I don't have too much time, I thought I would do this neat graphic for you. How do we explain the success of the revolution in Sudan? These are the elements that uh, made this uh, revolution successful. I'd like to point this out to those interested in up other popular uprisings in North Africa as well. Following an economic crisis in Sudan that occurred in 2017 and 18, what you had is collective grievances and, of course, new framing, which is important. But in the case of Sudan, it's these new mobilization networks created by young people, including, of course, women, that becomes a really important way to undermine the dictatorial regime of Omar Bashir and eventually lead to popular protest uh, and 
in conjunction, and here it's important, with at the time uh, international support by the United States, European Union and others, at least pulling back from um, supporting the military uh, Bashir regime, in combination you had the successful revolution itself. Um, the economic crisis was one that was very deep. After seven years of, uh, you know, experiencing great uh, wealth in terms of oil export, the Sudan split into two. Eight percent of the oil in Sudan went to South Sudan, um, and immediately overnight, you had a deep economic crisis on the part of the state. This, of course, uh, laid the context for the successful uh, revolution because of the mobilization following this economic crisis. Women played a very, very central role. Just recently, in the UN speech of Biden that he gave to the United Nations, he said, if you, if you listen to that speech, I don't know why you would, but if you listen to that speech, you would see that you know, he said, um, I am really uh, in admiration of the Sudanese women um, in particular because of their push for democratization. It's absolutely true. Women played a central role for, uh, for a variety of reasons we can discuss, but they were really crucial in terms of creating new mobilization structures, both at the level of the middle class, but also uh, at the level of uh, the campuses, which really become important. They also were part of the leadership in a successive um, um, period of, uh, of uh, a protest that laid the groundwork for mobilization, which is really important. Women also, although they're seen also in very much cosmetic way, were central leaders in a crucial organization called the Sunnis Professional Association. Uh, they weren't just members and activists or, you know, uh, stand... Uh, stood by. They actually uh, were at the very leadership position of the Sudanese Professional Association. And this is an association that uh, coordinated all of these protests um, and made that revolution successful. So, in terms of the framing, how did these protesters convince the entire population of Sudan that this was a revolution uh, worth uh, winning or a revolution that uh, could uh, be successful? Uh, this is taken, of course, from social movement literature, but they framed uh, the, the grievances in ways that resonated across different ethnic groups and different classes, right? So in any kind of revolutions, as you know, the fissures, the social and economic class and ethnic, especially in the African context, uh, really stand in the way of any kind of collective action that would be successful. And this is where the, they, the, these activists really played such an important role in bridging these gaps. Uh, and of course, the objective was full civilian democracy, Madania, um, and it was very, very important for them to convince a wide array of Sudanese that this was important. They did this, if you don't have to know Arabic to see this poster, they did this by um, disseminating messages and information, telling people the details of the corruption uh, and the economic crisis in Sudan, and that it was primarily a result of this dictatorial regime. So even if you weren't um, that lit literate, uh, uh, you would uh, be able to understand very quickly what this revolution was about. And so quickly, uh, people in the rural areas, in other areas, uh, were uh, joined with middle class and educated as well, which was very important. I wanted to show, I'm not going to read all of this, but this continues now. Following, following the Burhan coup, what you had is young people, these are protesters, this is both in Arabic and English that was distributed, quickly disseminate information about what this uh, coup is about, what Burhan is doing, how many people are detained, you know, what, all, what, is his, what are his policies. So the discourse of Burhan that uh, dictators make, generals make, that I'm saving the country, but this is, you know, I'm going to fix your economy, all of that is quickly undermined by activists who uh, disseminate information uh, about what's going on. It becomes really important when there is an internet blackout as well. Um, so basically, to explain the success, uh, these young people, mostly young but some older, devised new methods to combat the security forces. Um, they uh, framed a, a different count, kind of counter-narrative to that of the state, you know, to, to show people that this was a really important national movement, not just a few privileged people who are protesting. Um, 
And they coordinated, as I mentioned, this very important coordinating body that is now being, rep I was in Lebanon last year and um, giving a talk like this and the Lebanese were asking me, what is this about? We want to know. And after that, they created a Lebanese, Sudanese, uh, Lebanese professional association as well. Um, and this professional association becomes really important in coordinating different groups in society. They're essentially doctors and lawyers and uh, engineers, um, you know, uh, professionals. And finally, of course, uh, very importantly, you have to convince the international community. This is a protester recently, just uh, last week, um, signaling to Biden that, um, that it's very important to undo the coup. You know? So part of the strategy also is to explain to the international community that this revolution is peaceful. Hence the title that I began, Saurat <laughs> Nesilmiya, that there is nothing to fear. This is actually a revolution that is based on civil disobedience and will construct a more peaceful Sudan rather than unstable Sudan. Um, that is a message that, of course, not only the United States is interested in, but also the regional countries as well. Very quickly, why did this man take over? I'm going to go quickly over this. Um, this is uh, the slide that shows the kind of transitional government at the time. The Sovereign Council, the Forces of Freedom of Change, which is civil society opposition, resistance committees and women's organizations. The resistance committees basically are a grassroots organization. So this schematic shows you the structure of, uh, of the transitional arrangements and the government, because I didn't want to go too much in detail. But you'll see uh, there's pressure, at least during the, the transition period before the coup, between all of these different uh, um, elements. Now, you probably, if you followed, had heard that Burhan and the generals basically um, have tried to explain to the international community that this transitional government failed. Actually, it didn't. The coordination between these different groups actually got Sudan back into the international community. It opened up the economy of Sudan to the World Bank and IMF for those interested. Uh, in that it, as I said, it, they liberalized the foreign exchange. Uh, they got Sudan lifted, it from, lifted from states that sponsor terrorism. All of these successes occurred under civilian government under this government. Um, so why did Burhan, of course, the generals are saying it was a failure. Actually, in two years, the success is really actually remarkable to see that Sudan becomes part of the international community once again. So that's why it's really important to emphasize the successes as, as well. It's true, civil society is complex in Sudan as it is in all countries. You have an amalgamation of political parties, civil society organizations, and also rebel insurgent organizations. So there is a diverse mix that uh, is really important to keep in mind. But the biggest reason or the, that um, to begin with the Brown, to return to the Brown Daily Herald uh, quote, that you had um, a reversal of democratization. Um, and the first really important critical juncture for that was a very historic agreement called the Juba Agreement signed on October 2020 between the central government, this, uh, this government, and um, insurgent groups in uh, Darfur, in those areas that I showed you, in the conflict zones, okay? Why was this so pivotal? Very quickly, it changed the contours of the transitional arrangements that were established in 2019. And it did so literally by just increasing the military representation of the military cadre, both in terms of the, 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 the national army, so to speak, or the, the generals, but also the leaders of these insurgent organizations. And what happened is that at all of the different levels, especially the, the, the ex executive council, you had more military men than, than uh, civilians represented. Um, rotational presen presidency was postponed further, and uh, in terms of the representation, you had now 25% uh, increase in uh, insurgent military people. So what we saw in this period is the decline of civilian authority and the rise, overwhelming power of the military and the insurgent organizations. And this was, I would say, the beginning of uh, leading up to the coup, which is very important to keep in mind. This is Hamdok, the man who is now ostensibly the, 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 um, the prime minister. Um, he was challenged by this Juba agreement in two important ways. And number one, um, 
he, his power really was undermined by the inclusion of two insurgent leaders in Darfur. Um, you don't, if you want their names, I can tell you, but these were very important leaders that were brought in to, to uh, enact a peace agreement and stop the conflict. But what they did instead is, of course, they sided with the military leaders, um, and that, of course, undermined the prime minister's power. Another aspect is um, these uh, military leaders delayed what I emphasized was crucial, and that is the establishment of a parliament. Okay? You cannot have a democracy of any type if you don't have a parliament, a representative parliament. And the idea for the military generals was to do anything in their power to stop this establishment of a parliament because then you'd have oversight over all their policies and they'd be voted out in the elections, right? So this is kind of the machinations that went, went on. Um, in a desperate move to overthrow uh, the civilian government, the generals went and uh, patronized a group of ethnic uh, tribal groups in Port Sudan, that port, and they blocked that port. That port is one of the most, it's the most important port that brings in food uh, and commodities to Sudan. So basically, uh, the generals were using food as a weapon. In addition to that, it's on the Red Sea, so it destabilized the interest of, uh, of the, you know, United Arab Emirates and everyone who actually uh, does traffic in the Red Sea, one of the most important waterways. The entire globe, and I kept getting phone calls from the BBC, what's going on, those kind of things, because the entire globe was panicking. Um, and the idea was for the general, uh, General Burhan, was to starve Sudanese out, to deepen the economic crisis, and then say, I'm going to intervene to uh, solve this. Uh, it didn't work because the youth activists went back on the street and said, you're lying, you're you know, starving us, and we're, we're not, we're not, we're not going to accept this. This is why the messaging is so important, the information uh, dissemination is so important. Um, there were two reasons that Burhan took over then after that failed, uh, because uh, Sudanese mobilized against him. One of them was accountability, and that is we go back to the massacre of June 3rd. Um, it's very well known and, uh, uh, by now, and there's clear evidence that Burhan and his deputy um, were uh, responsible. Um, for even if they didn't uh, massacre these young young kids themselves, that they uh, there was basically uh, promoted and patronized and allowed for the for this massacre to happen. And so there's a very real like likelihood, if he didn't in intervene and take over power, that he would be indicted by the International Criminal Court. And so that issue of accountability becomes a, a, a way or a fear on the part of Burhan one of the most important reasons why he uh, took over power. Um, another was, we go back to the deep state, and this is why it's so important. It's not just me having written this book, but every Sudanese knows that there's a deep state in Sudan. Uh, I just happen to have detailed it. But here, as part of the, of the, the, the agreement, the transitional agreement, something was called, uh, that established called the, the Committee to Dismantle the Deep State. And that committee was designed to um, basically indict uh, um, all of the corrupt uh, businessmen and politicians and military leaders that had basically uh, monopolized the economy, including the military. So the idea was to get, bring the military back under civilian authority and also bring the national economy back under civilian rule rather than being monopolized by the military and the Islamist. And so this was a very important uh, committee that was supposed to hold those people uh, accountable. It posed a huge threat to General Burhan and the Islamists themselves because it basically was designed to undermine their financial interest in ways that would make them deeply unpopular, of course, in terms of uh, support. So the main people, the f some of, I think the first people who were imprisoned after the coup were this, this gentleman, were Tisaleh and others, <coughs> who had been members of this committee. They were tortured even more than the student activists uh, because of the role that they were playing in uh, undermining the interest of, these, uh, of the generals. In November 21st, uh, I want to show this again to quickly see, tell you what this has meant for Sudan. 
this is how the transitional arrangements were. And last night I was thinking, how can I do this quickly? And I thought, okay, I'm just going to take these arrows away. And this is what it looks like now. From a period where you had coordination and pressures among the different groups, now you have Burhan and Hamdok isolated. Um, and you have civil society organizations and grassroots organizations that are trying to mobilize with each other on the street, uh, but what is happening is that there is no relationship linkage between the Sovereign Council of Burhan, Hamdok, and the others. In other words, Hamdok, who was uh, nominated by civil society groups and political parties, now is completely isolated. He has no constituency. Now, you can imagine what does that mean for dem democratization. What it means that it's, of course, obstructs uh, um, uh, mobilization. I want to conclude, because I know I've gone over time, but um, it's very important um, to understand, despite what you might hear, that Hamdok is back in power, and so he's a civilian, everything is okay, that the agreement between him and the general, if you look at it very closely, uh, basically, it is, uh, militarizes um, the, 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 the transition itself. It rep represents a clear obstacle to civilian democracy. It's basically a cosmetic agreement that claims to uh, ensure comprehensive political participation and to appoint a technocratic government. But those of us, of course, who study Sudan or are from Sudan know full well, number one, there's no timetable for election. Uh, number two, they get to the military, the generals get to appoint all of the ministers. You know, no civilian has a say in that. Um, you know, they, they talk about expanding political participation, by which they mean they're going to include, you know, their own people. Um, and so if you look at the articles, they're going to restructure the committee I just spoke about, which means freeze it so that uh, their you know, corruption is not exposed. And so all of this really delimits any possibility of democratization. Finally, of course, there's the international linkages. And this is the man who's the head of the militia, the deputy to the general. And I wanted to conclude maybe a keep saying conclude. Um, gold is Sudan's most important uh, resource. In Africa, it's the largest uh, exporter of gold um, in the continent, which is saying a lot. And most of this gold is smuggled to the United Arab Emirates. So you can see the, the linkages between there. Uh, many of these mines and, uh, uh, and gold interests are controlled by this gentleman, who's a deputy to the general and the head of the militia itself. So you see that it's very violent in that sense. So I want to, literally I want to conclude with peaceful civil disobedience. This is the reason why I think democracy is possible in Sudan, because of the work of, uh, of the young people. We can go into that, but I wanted to conclude with the title, of, uh, because this is what the young people told me to emphasize. They always say, Professor, make sure to tell them that it's peaceful. And it is peaceful. It's peaceful, it's different. It's, it encompasses the entire city, these are protest marches that are, like I said, who are, that were organized based on the blueprint of, of civil disobedience histories in India and elsewhere. Um, and I really want to conclude with, definitely going to conclude with this. Um, this is a displaced camp in Darfur. And um, it is just one element of civil disobedience. There is a whole array that Sudanese are embarked upon. Uh, work stoppages, protests, boycotts, including uh, also, you know, uh, isolating family members who actually collude with the military forces, which in Sudan, you know, it's a, a big thing. Um, in addition to all of that, there is what Sudanese activists, young people call nadwat, which are literally seminars. Um, the height and the most important aspect is what Sudanese activists call our revolution is peaceful, our revolution is a revolution of consciousness. Democracy ultimately is really a normative thing, right? It's an idea. And in the context of uh, uh, cynicism globally about democratization, what you see is these are young people who are going to not just the urban areas. This is literally a displaced camp in northern Darfur. Darfur, of course, as you know, was a, a victim of genocide. And this is what these people are doing. This is a seminar. Uh, this paper is entitled Hurriya, Liberty. And the idea is to have a discussion about what liberty and freedom means. So I want to conclude by saying this is a revolution that actually is um, um, exemplary in, the ter in terms of revitalizing our very understanding of what democratic aspirations uh, mean globally. 
So when people are talking about the dying of democracy, like my former graduate students at Harvard and Levitsky and others, uh, this is a, a, you know, uh, really a, a case study of um, how to actually craft democracy. I'm sorry I went over. No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So you didn't go over at all. We started late. You were, you were oh, really? OK. I kept time. looking. Uh, OK. So, <laughs> so we have plenty of time for, for questions and discussion. Great. Okay. The floor is open. Sure. Um, no, you go ahead. Um, I, I wanted to ask about um, the idea of the nature of this and like how, what it means to expect non-violence of people. Um, when that's like You know, um, in this case, it was really uh, lessons learned over, you know, one of the reasons I told you these protests begin in 2011 is that the notion of a strategy of nonviolence to this degree was something that these activists learned. Um, they didn't practice that kind of nonviolence at the beginning. And they learned that it was the only option. So by, the, by 2013, um, when they did attempt to um, meet some of the police and militia through violence, they were essentially um, you know, exterminated. You know, there was a number of different young men, in particular, and women who were killed under horrible circumstances. And so by the time I began to do research in 2013, they would tell me that we have to re change our strategy that we cannot really be uh, confronting uh, this might of the security forces, the militias, and even the intelligence forces uh, through violence. So through that, they begin disseminating an insistence on, on, on nonviolence. It's done in two ways. One of them is, you, as you're protesting, you chant. Um, I'll tell you, what, the, the real story of what happened about that was when I arrived in Sudan in 2018, they asked me to clap and say Sevilla. And I said, what are you talking about? I'm too old for this. But uh, the idea is to quickly make sure that, that the protest, everyone in the protest knows that it has to be peaceful no matter what. Um, that's really an essential aspect of, of spreading the message of, uh, of Sumia. Um, another aspect is uh, really to make sure that you decentralize the protests. Um, so you don't have just this uh, protest in the, in the, in the, in the in, in the central squares, but you actually have protest in the neighborhoods. You know, small protest where uh, these activists can evade the security forces and still practice uh, this kind of civil disobedience. In other words, it's called in Arabic karufa. That is that you confront the security forces, but when they start attacking you, instead of attacking them back, you run back to your neighborhood and you just do a smaller protest. And so these strategies were then learned over time to evade um, this kind of uh, violence. Yeah, that's a really good question because um, there is no legislative body as such. There, in, in the agreement, you're, it was supposed to be established. Um, and this is with the last agreement with Burhan and Hamdok. The idea that I showed you was to establish, the general now says, Burhan, that he's going to establish a parliament and he's going to expand the political participation. What he's going to do, if you've read anything about um, African politics and even colonial politics in Africa, and, and that is he's, he's going to expand it by including what the British used to call native authorities. In other words, he's going to bring, 
<laughs> is going to bring like ethnic leaders. If you read, if you read Mahmoud Mamdani's work, for those of you who are, I'm sure you've read his work, <laughs> uh, you'll see that this is kind of, these are customary authorities. And basically he's going to establish a parliament that uh, are filled with his clients, you know, in the native authorities, these kind of customary authorities, um, and then say that he has a parliament. And that is the, the way for him to exclude uh, the political parties uh, that are programmatic, ideological, um, you know, that actually represent real civil society. So, um, you know, it's very important to keep that in mind. That's why I, I showed those articles to make sure that to emphasize that. Mm -hmm. I um, thank you so much. Of course, I've, I can hear you talk for days, and I still wouldn't be bored um, <laughs> because you really have a way of weaving problematic discourses in a way that we can understand it. You 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 hit on the, the very very issues at hand. Um, news news newspapers or uh, uh, radio stations ignore somehow. So what I want to ask maybe is to keep the Sudan as is now and look at the, uh, more of a, a regional sort of uh, our understanding of what's going on. I, coming from Eritrea, begin to be very nervous when I see Ethiopia fighting a, a civil war against uh, the, the Tigray or the Oromo. And, and then you have Sudan with the with potential of an, a, a, another sort of flare-up uh, because I don't trust what what the, what the military says. And then you have Egypt, which has been so quiet that it disturbs me. Yeah. And it seems to me that Egypt is just waiting for a moment where Egypt is not really interested in what's going on in the Sudan or in Ethiopia. What they're really interested in is the dam which has already cut down on the, on the waters that they, they are getting. So it behooves the, the Egyptians to have these two countries in the state that they are very chaotic, politically unbalanced. So how do you read this? What, what can we say might happen now to um, revise that old Nile Water Agreement, which uh, already cuts down the amounts of water that Egypt is receiving from from, from both, of, both of these countries? Well, um, I think Egypt is deeply involved. Uh, you know, I think there is a little bit of misinformation. Um, you know, when I speak to Sudanese who are experts on the Nile waters, they actually say something really interesting, and they're saying that this dam is not going to affect Egypt's water resources it's going to affect Sudan's resources. My, my opinion is that Egypt is um, not uh, typical, you know, playing it very well in the sense, you know, publicly, internationally, it's about the dam, the dam, the dam. But much more destabilizing, and that what I think Egypt really is afraid of, is the re renegotiation of the Nile Waters Agreement of the late 1950s. Because that has a real potential to occur, because the Nile Basin countries are about seven or eight countries. Um, and so what Egypt is not telling people is, it's not so much the Renaissance Dam, um, but it is Ethiopia's move towards you know, getting those other Nile Basin countries to renegotiate the Nile Waters Agreement. Rene renegotiating the Nile Waters Agreement does in fact mean that other African countries, uh, as far afield as Rwanda, will say, well, we want some, some volume as well. You know, you can't just have all the volume. I think that the legal and aspect of it you know, because when I speak to environmentalists and people I respect in Sudan, they keep saying the Renaissance Dam is not going to, because the, most of the volume of water is going to affect Sudan, um, you know, uh, rather than, than Egypt. So um, I think that Egypt absolutely is involved in, in Ethiopia, uh, and I think the government is in, invested in its chaos. Um, because I think Abye had been pushing very hard, not only on the Renaissance Dam, but also to, to, to change this Nile Water Agreement. So I think it's really important. Because, you know, in that sense, you, it, it becomes clear the military government uh, is, 
it's what's, what, what people sort of would look forward to rather than a civilian government. I don't know why um, the understanding that a civilian government wouldn't be able to, to hold or, uh, a dialogue on, on, on issues of water or regional security and so on. But you're absolutely right that for, to have a destabilized uh, Sudan is a, is a problem for the region. Yeah. Uh, and, but also a problem for the Middle East. There's, there's no question, I think that as uh, the Sudanese lawyer puts it very diplomatically, Sudan is at, in a tough uh, neighborhood and, and we appreciate that, that people are concerned about its lack of stability or its potential for instability. But what I'm tr trying to express here is that um, Sudan is uh, the best aspect, the best reason way to stabilize Sudan is through uh, a civilian democratic dispensation. Um, right now, for example, Burhan is creating a conflict with the Ethiopian border. He's saying to the Americans, I'm protecting you from Ethiopia's chaos. Hebeti, two days ago, you, I don't know if you've heard, he threatened the European Union. He said, if you don't support me, I'm going to do what Belarus is doing, you know, uh, the dictator in Belarus. I'm going to you know, open the borders and you'll have immigrants from Africa flooding your shores. These are not agents of stability. This is basically, he's blackmailing the European Union. Uh, you know, uh, Burhan is pretending that he's defending the region against the Ethiopian chaos. Um, all of that, why? Because domestically they know that they have li very little support. And so my, my point is that um, all of this is acknowledged by Sudanese activists here. There's a, a, a slogan in Arabic about Egypt and United Arab Emirates. So I think that, you know, crafting a civilian democracy actually is more, more stable. Yeah. Um, I, I have a number of um, uh, questions that are with uh, detail, not necessarily related. Um, it struck me that the military's control of these uh, financial networks uh, and markets of black markets uh, that there <coughs> seems to be still uh there is still control of uh, are there? Yes, the you know <laughs> Well, I was just going to say that when I finished this book, I thought, okay, well, at least the other parts are more relevant. And then now I'm like, oh my goodness, yeah. The person who's, which is good for me, right? But the person who's been reappointed, um, the person who's been appointed the governor of the central bank uh, just a few weeks ago after the coup um, is the brother-in-law of uh, the deputy of the Islamist party, the National Congress party. Okay, I can go down the list and tell you what the appointments are. Do, do, do the Americans and others know this? Not so much. I mean, who, who keeps tabs on all of this guy? So they, he's reconstituting, especially over the economy, these same Islamists that I, was, uh, I wrote about. Um, but he's, he's doing it under the guise of appointing technocrats. He's saying they're not ideological, but we all know who they are. And to have someone there at the central bank means that uh, at the same time he's going to ask the World Bank to reinstate the two billion um, uh, loans. Imagine the central bank is, you know, led by the Islamists related to Burhan, and now they want the World Bank to <laughs> give them money. So this, these are very important uh, elements. I did work on, with the World Bank on this issue, actually, on, on <laughs> regulating. And so... Uh, this is very serious business. Now, it's not only if you're opposed to the Islamist, um, I hope that I demonstrated, and I think it's better in the book, that um, it's not so much the ideological aspect only, it's just the deep corruption um, that uh, overwhelms and monopolizes the private sector. So, um, you know, even if you like Islamist, you should not be interested in someone who's the head of central bank, who's related to the general, uh, who's, appointed himself the head of government. You know what I mean? So, um, are there other such networks that are not controlled by the military? Yes, there are, yeah. There are networks, but the, the, the major uh, financial networks are controlled, mm -hmm. controlled by the military and the Islamists. So it's crucial to their survival. So it's crucial to, to their survival. So in, in that sense, uh, would I also successful in, in dominating the Islamist movement through, through, through these uh, control mechanisms of, of the 
illicit, illicit market, urban networks, and uh, that other Islamic organization is a, a kind of moderate Islam still exists uh, that that has a political expression of a dimension. Like the Republican a long time. Oh, you mean in terms of political, Islamic political yes. parties? Well, I mean, the majority of Muslims are all moderate Muslims in general. And then there's the, the Sufi parties, the Ummah party that is conservative but not radical. And then there's the, the Democratic Unionist party. These are Muslim parties of the type that uh, African Islam is, which is majority mm -hmm. Sufi. So, yeah, those are... And they're, they're participating in this... Uh, they are. They tend to be easily co-opted because they're conservative ideologically, but they, now that they've condemned the, the general, they participate in the movement. Um, I'll give you an example. The Ummah Party, Lena, you'd like this, uh, um, you know, the, the, the head of the Ummah Party hosted those insurgent groups in his home in that Ummah, it's the house of the party. And just uh, the young people from the party, because they're with these young people, um, went and protested outside and kicked them out of the, you know. And now they've, the young people in the party want to kick the leader of the party out. Okay, so yes, this is what's happening. What's happening now is really interesting. You know, young people and others are being very critical about the political party and their leadership. They're um, being very critical about um, uh, patriarchy. Uh, you know, I can show you other slogans about dealing with patriarchy. Uh, there's a, some of these seminars are led by young women who talk about a quota system not being meaningful representation for women. So don't, don't show us two women in government, we don't care. You know, that's not meaningful representation. This is a real, truly rev cultural revolution. I mean, I'm old, so I mean, when I was at Brown, I don't think I would have imagined that young Sudanese would, would do that. I mean, I protested at Brown too, but it oh wasn't a, God, yeah. Yes, did. I did, I did. Yeah, like Carter Brown and Third World Center. And yeah, we did all of that in the 80s, but this is really astronomical, so. Daniel? Daniel? I did that. Good, good. I did still hurt like looking at the question. So I was struck by where you ended the talk, which was sort of like the kind of mention of freedom and the ways that this would be constructive. I didn't catch that being said that it's constructive on our earth, right? You're sort of thinking about Yeah, Levitsky and yeah. Yeah, and for me, I think as a non expert, the question that I'm left with is thinking about uh, what is the force of non violence here, and which is the force, the political force of non violence, especially. Because the way that I agree with framing it is that it is in some ways an anxiety about the capacity of the state to do, or the military to do sort of extreme amounts of violence onto bodies of people who are protesting, which to me then means that it's, I don't hear nonviolence as a, as a, a kind of larger ideological, political question, but a practical, material question of we cannot do to the state or to the military to us. And so if that is the frame of nonviolence, the question then further becomes what is the what is the potency of nonviolence? What does nonviolence accomplish beyond just the uh, uh, preservation? Which I don't think is the, the entire of your argument, but just sort of the way that I I've heard from the Oh, you you're going to what an interesting question. Um, so the question, let me, let's, I just want to be clear that I understand yeah. it, yeah. So the question is, um, what is the potency of, 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 of non-violent civil disobedience? Um, in this context in particular, beyond just kind of preservation, which is how it comes out. Oh, yes, you know, it is very similar to the Black Lives Matter movement. And, uh, you know, at, at McGill, believe it or not, I'm trying to establish an institute for African and black studies, for example. And we have candidates now who work on this issue. And I asked him a similar question about the spectacle of protest and what it does. What, what, is, what, is, what are these, you know, what happens? I think that what maybe anthropologists sometimes call, uh, there's uh, one aspect is meaning making, um, which I find really, really important. This is one of the reasons I also show these slogans, whether it's, you know, getting the word out in terms of consciousness raising, which becomes uh, important, and linking up whether it's, let's say, the black community with indigenous communities uh, through the public protest uh, 
and this is what happens here. So what's meaningful here is um, civil disobedience is not about um, apathy or pacifism. It really is agency action driven, I think. And it, it, in the sense that, I'll give you an example. One of the most important aspects of this revolution has been interrogating race and racism in Sudan. And um, that begins when I was doing focus groups in, um, in 2011, when I had fo focus groups with, with Sudanese from all the different parts of the country. And they start, they start telling me that they're trying to address issue of racism. Now you have to understand, Lena will tell you that in our countries, we don't use that word historically. Right, Lena? So, I mean, I, when we grew up, we wouldn't use that. We use ethnicity, tribe, uh, but for those of you who visited Africa, you'll know that that's a very new phenomenon. These young people are dealing with it uh, because of the conflicts in the Nuba Mountain and Darfur, and because of the demographic shifts in, in Greater Khartoum. Greater Khartoum used to look very much like me and Lena. You know, we were coming from specific ethnic groups. Now it's really, demography has changed, just like in the urban areas all over the United States and Canada. And so part of the civil disobedience is Thawrat al a revolution of consciousness. Let's, in this process, also uh, collectively deal with issues associated with uh, racism in our, you know, uh, patriarchy, misogyny. Um, all of that is happening in the public square. Um, and this is what the sit-in was about. The sit-in, the, the, the reason I always emphasize the tragedy of it, um, you know, is because the sit-in was a beautiful space, a physical space, where every day people would be, bring food they would address issues of racism, patriarchy, and poverty. And so in, in the Arabic colloquium, it, you know, they would have, um, uh, uh, you know, basically they would say, if, if you don't have food, uh, take. Uh, if you have food, give. You know, this all was happening in the city, and it became a really important locus of consciousness raising, um, so it, beyond evading the security forces. And I think that these uh, protests now are a permanent fixture, not only in the United States, but in, in North Africa and America, where it has now become a permanent source of politics, a different kind of politics. Uh, and so, no matter what these generals do, at the level of society, uh, there is a shift that is happening, uh, okay? So just like here, you can't change the structure of government overnight. <laughs> but I think there's something, a shift is happening. You know, I, we got McGill to commit to like 40 uh, black professors in the next four years. And that's because of the shift in, yeah, I mean, we got some in trouble for that, but, but Professor Frazetti told me to keep fighting, right? <laughs> so, does that answer your question? Yeah. <coughs> So, um, <clears throat> three questions, two of them is kind of more empirical maybe, and then one of kind of bigger one that's somehow related to Brian's question. The first one is, <clears throat> why was this Juba agreement agreed to and by whom? If it was so consequential, who agreed to it and why? Yeah. The second one is, <clears throat> why did this prime minister agree to come back? Like, did he, does he think he's doing something noble? Was he forced to? Um, I mean, it seems strange, I mean, it seems like to be, at a distance over here, it looks like he's totally discredited, and I assume that must be the case among many of his followers there. So why did he do it? Did they do it at a, did he do it at gunpoint? Was he never really invested in the in the revolution, or does he somehow think that this is the most the best way forward? So those are the two kind of empirical questions. And then the, the big question is coming back to your ending so positively about um, about democracy and 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 nonviolence and and and, and your use over the course of the talk of mul multiple times of the term revolution as if it happened. And I would say the most cynical version of the question I could ask is to say, you know, it didn't happen. I mean, it didn't happen in, it didn't happen in Tunisia, look at Tunisia now, it didn't, happen in, it didn't happen in Libya, look at Libya now, it didn't happen in Egypt, look at Egypt now. We're just seeing the same thing in the Sudan again. And, and because you're Sudanese and you want it to happen, you believe in it, but, but to a cynical kind of material, you know, it, it, it's all economics, it's all politics, it's all power. To me, it looks like it didn't happen. It looks like, it looks, it looks like it's just gonna play out like in Egypt or something like that. So, so why not? Why, why, why am I wrong about that? Wow, what great questions, yeah. I mean, that's, those are the questions. I don't know if you've seen my eyes are bloodshot because when it's, <laughs> it's been a very difficult few weeks for us um, because of, uh, if you visit Sudan, you'll understand, I think, um, you know, it's, um, um, I'm very, very much from brown Americanized, but Sudanese are really very, a little bit, uh, 
more deserving than I am, let's put it that way. But um, the first question is, this is the sad tale of the Juba Agreement, was something that the, 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 these activists insisted on. It was part and parcel of the first, um, is, uh, what was called the forces, uh, the, the platform for the forces of freedom of change. In January 2019, um, these activists uh, that I you know, itemized for you, not just the kids, everyone, said the number one thing we want is to stop the wars in our country. That was the number one thing. This is the track, the, the, just to show you the betrayal, right? So it was the number one thing. It was insisted upon by everyone, you know? Remember, this is huge for Sudan. Three different wars ongoing, and these young people are saying, we do, we're not focusing on bread. Stop this wars now, okay? Stop them now. Th that is why there was such support for the Juba Agreement. It was supposed to be a process of negotiations. What happened in the Juba Agreement, it was hijacked by Burhan, the general. He is the one who went to uh, South Sudan to negotiate. And then he selected the two leaders of the Darfur rebels, you know, each of whom represent no more than 4% 4, 4 of their population. Is that, you know? So he played the game of divide and rule quickly and then established what was called the Transitional Partnership Council. Um, the, as soon as that happened, the most legitimate opposition civilians in government all resigned. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, Notice, yeah he's, uh, this is why the biggest mistake people say is that April 19th, of course, the young, the more, the young people is that they should have just kept fighting uh, in April 19th, 2019. But by that time, um, there are different points of view. By that time, um, many Sudanese were just tired of the violence um, and were concerned. They wanted peace, but many people, you know, said that they should have just kept going. So that's the Jubilee Agreement. The second question was, why did the prime minister? Agree well, that's a question everyone asks, and I was in shock myself. Yeah, I was in shock myself. It's a very good question. I'll tell you what's interesting about the question, though. Number one is that you think this population would be going around saying, let's hang this guy, you know, you think. But what's really happening, just to give you an idea, is the, the, the consensus among the activists and people is that let's not focus on him as an individual, let's focus on the, the, the manner of governance rather than who's going to govern. Um, why he did it, I speculate, you know, of course there are lots of speculations, one of them he's, he was threatened or not. My feeling is that um, he got the green light from internet, regional actors. That's my feeling, that he got the green light from, um, you know, Ethiopia is happening, uh, there's real feel of stability. I wish I could show the map of Sudan again. It's so geostrategically placed. My feeling is that uh, um, regional actors uh, and members of the international community may have said, you know, continue. He said that he, he returned to save Sudan from chaos and he's returned to, to implement the economic policies. So that's his... Uh, uh, the last question was, uh, is it working or not, you mean? Mm, yeah. <laughs> is it really a revolution? Maybe. You know, it's so interesting because uh, uh, I initially I did not think it was a revolution because, of course, um, uh, and, you know, I, I'm trained and grew up in a place where the end point is supposed to be a particular form of civilian democracy. And absolutely, in that sense, it's failed. Absolutely. Just like all the others, you know. One colleague wrote that Sudan is the last domino, you know, after Tunisia, because you see, you've seen what's happened in Tunisia. Um, <clears throat> but interestingly enough, I think that uh, um, these young people have asked me to redefine what revolution is. One of the reasons I, I did the title, Re Our Revolution is Peaceful, because I know from a Western audience, uh, revolution connotes, uh, especially mainstream Western audience, revolution connotes violence, it connotes this and that and the other. And um, I wanted to make sure that people understood this is a peaceful uh, revolution, not necessarily at the level of state, but at the level of society. And um, that is still, I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced, because I feel so different from these younger generation. There are lots of reasons why the younger generation is different. I did research in Morocco as well, as well as Egypt with young people. They are, um, they feel that they have uh, less economic opportunity. 
out migration is, uh, you know, limited, uh, and they are less ideological. You know, uh, they're actually non-ideological. Um, you know, pe uh, people are always asking um, who is leading these people, um, and the truth is there's no political party leading them. They're not right wing. They're not communist. They're not this. They're they. The reason they're not is because they've seen that that hasn't worked, and that's revolutionary. That's revolutionary. I think it's revolutionary. But, but the fact that so, I mean, um, my early works in the 80s in the Sudan on agricultural development, and coming out of that study to show that rural, in the rural areas, women were very actively involved in, in running the field and so forth. And to speak to uh, University of Khartoum women, they would say, well, they shouldn't be shame on them. They shouldn't be working. They should not be out of the house. And now, I see a total change. I mean, for me, to have the involvement of women in, 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 in public, yeah. and two years ago, she, one of the, the poster pictures was a woman for, for the revolution. So I think maybe we should maybe change the question slightly is that where are some of the takeaway? And the revolution doesn't have a beginning and an end. I mean, at least I don't see it that way. I see that it's an ongoing. Yeah. It's already achieved a lot of patriarchy is on the attack. Perfect. Yeah. Women are now have e demand equal access to uh, positions in government and so forth. So I think it has achieved something that we did not think. And compared to to Egypt, for example, to Tahrir Square, from one day to the other, it was over. This is not going to be over. Yeah. It's not. It's, and as Sudanese will always tell you, don't ever compare us to Egypt, for example. Um, I think anthropologists have a little bit of a way of dealing with this more. I, I will tell you the political science, whether it's, I can cite you names and stuff, in terms of people working on the, the North Africa, have changed their unit of analysis because of the failure. They have begun to start talking like I'm talking about. Um, is this a new form of politics? What is happening? Are these issue areas? So, for example, you know, civilian democracy is not possible. But Sitten Nafur, the woman who was martyred recently, I, I was going to, uh, to, to put it on a slide, but I thought it would be a little too much. But she was a, a female activist, and she died. She, she had something called Pink for Kandakas. It's a hashtag. And in it, she has a, a picture. She was killed by the security forces, and she's the now most, most popular, famous, you know, most utilized martyr, so to speak. In, in Arabic, she writes, um, you know, uh, you know um, about women. Uh, she's beautiful. She's complete. She's brave. She's, you know, whatever. The, re recasting the dignity of woman after three decades where there's a public order law that actually brutalized women on the street. That is a form of you know, real at an anthropological level, at the level of community, it's absolutely, uh, um, you know, unbelievable. I can tell you stories of the city and others how young men, uh, these youth, are dealing with women as well, you know. Uh, so, because I did a lot of interviews, and uh, as an example, as they're protesting, one of them uh, this was telling me, uh, she's from Burri, uh, she, she said, uh, one of the young men said, you go in the back. This is what happens in Algeria. In Algeria, they'll tell the women to go in the back in the protest. So he tells her to go in the back. This other guy says, she's not going in the back. She goes in front like all of us. Like, in other words, if we're going to get shot, she should get shot too. But look at, you know, it's like, you know, but, she, but, but no one goes in the back. Um, the ululating, I was going to read it too for this book I'm writing about, the, the use of the uh, zahruta, um, you know, it's when women ululate. And so the use of zaruta is to call, um, what happens is that the young woman will go to the square and she'll uh, ululate. And then the, the men, the young men will come around her to start the protest, but also to protect her. So they're using tr traditional in, in, idioms of celebration to mobilize both men and women. That's revolutionary. At the anthropological level, it's, it's revolutionary to do that kind of meaning making, deconstructing patriarchy. Um, most importantly, um, really, really, the race war in Darfur, um, I don't know if it makes sense. For the urban areas, Darfur, the racism against Western Sudanese, historically, is so strong uh, 
that one of the most famous um, uh, you know, slogans is um, Ya hakim ya maghrur, kull al balad darfur. It rhymes. In other words, you, you arrogant ruler, all of us are from Darfur. So don't intervene, don't perpetuate race, so racial discourse and racial violence. So if you're going to, right now, it's not in the news, but they're killing Darfurians every day. In Jabal Moon, in, 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 you know, in Al Jinena, Lina, they're, you know, now you think there's, you know, they're telling the international community we're at peace, but the so called black Africans in the West are being, every day they're being butchered, um, you know, in, in the hundreds. So these are young people saying, we're not, this is not uh, tenable anymore. We're, you know, so at the level of society, that's important. It's another also argument why this is a force of stability, not instability. Because if you're going to, uh, bridge this ethnic divide, um, it's really, uh, really, really important. The question becomes whether these regional uh, actors like Egypt want something like that or not. So. Thank you so much.